Donc on va commencer cette nouvelle session qui est donc consacrée à, à l'imaginaire autour des, des grades écossais. Et à... This new session on the uh, representations of the Scottish degrees and devoted to new documents that came to light. So please uh, take your seats. Alors, donc c'est une session où on aura une communication. We will have a presentation by Laurent Segalini, then by Arturo Orios, and finally uh, uh, Joe and Joe Wager, and finally to conclude, Arvet Hubler on a really mythological aspect, which is the reference to Frederick the Great. But to introduce all of this, one might say that the Franken manuscript had a European uh, origin, uh, including French uh, origin, because there were Scottish degrees uh, that were that existed in France, but we didn't know much more than that. But um, a lot of research has been done in the last 20 years, and the Beilu manuscript was discovered, a 1764 manuscript, which is the French original of the Franken manuscript. Arturo Oyos um, rediscovered an oldest uh, Franken manuscript, uh, 1769, and so we uh, had more information and we could create a bridge on um, regarding the origin of uh, Scottish masonry in France and Scottish uh, masonry per se. The museum uh, p purchased a few years ago a document that gives us very interesting information on what was happening before the Bailo manuscript. So what took uh, Morin with him at the beginning of the 1760s? with him from Paris. The Laurent will tell you about the 1763 Kadosh uh, certificate, and it gives us more information on this neo uh, Kadosh system uh, that Morin will then encounter. Laurent, uh, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Perfect. So before uh, starting, um, I have to apologize. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, you are the victims of a fallacy. Because uh, contrary to what the program uh, said, I will not mention the Kadosh degree. I will focus on uh, the everything that happened before uh, 1761, before it arrived in Paris. At the time, it was called Grand Inspector, Grand Elect CQS, and came with François Le Boucher de Lénoncourt, uh, worshipful of the military lodge of the virtue that was built in Germany, in Hanau, in August 1760, during the Seven Year War, before moving to Metz. We know that Boucher de Lénoncourt was a former army officer and an, an aspiring police officer our, uh, police inspector is one of the signatories of the Morin patent in 1761. We also know that he received the degree of Grand Inspector Grand Elect from another military man, Jean Baptiste de Barail, or Du Barail, who was the founder of uh, the lodge in Anno. When he arrived in Metz at the end of this year, Le Boucher came uh, closer to uh, the perfect friend's lodge and his venerable Antoine Meunier de Precourt. Uh, um, and uh, he passed this, uh, this degree of Grand Inspector to him. Moving on to the series of degree, it was built around a classical uh, core, more or less uh, loyal to uh, the standard of the Grand Lodge at the beginning of the 1750s, the symbolic uh, degrees um, and then uh, master perfect and a series of degrees of elect. Then there were two other uh, degrees, uh, Knight of the uh, West and a Sublime Scottish and an architect in three degrees, 
move, uh, then the royal arch and the worshipful of the lodge, and finally the grand inspector, grand elect. Before that, there was uh, between the symbolical grade and the master perfect, there were uh, this weird degree of fondeur. In his letters to Villermoz, Muni de Precourt talks about uh, various uh, degrees, uh, but does not say where it comes from. Uh, and I quote, all of the degrees I talked about are subordinate to the latest and all tend towards it. We find a, um, a similar series of degrees uh, south of Metz 10 years later in the Loge Parfait des Intéressements in Mircourt and all the rituals are, uh, are kept in a f uh, found class in Amsterdam. Uh, and there was the same sequence as in Mess uh, to the Grand Inspector, but the Royal Arch and a Worshipful of the Lodge, which were in Mess um, right before Grand Inspector and Grand Elect, were this time uh, replaced by a uh, Rosicrucian Knight uh, degree and Sublime Philosopher that was not present in Metz. The doc doc uh, documents show that at the time of Saint-Jean du Parfait des Intéressements, it was in a uh, new lodge, but was revived by former members, including Pierre Laurent Chanter. In March 1768, he wrote to the past worshipful uh, to ask to send a, a book that will contain all of the colors of the tables and the, the jewels, uh, because they didn't remember any of it. Um, it shows that the degrees practiced by in Mircourt from 1769 were the one of the former uh, lodge, the past lodge, but that they n just needed uh, their memories refreshed. Two other letters of March 1769 between the new and the past venerables of the Mircourt uh, lodge uh, uh, about uh, getting the constitution and the degrees um, show a new name, Jean-Baptiste de Baray, who, he, who constituted in Germany the Lodge Boucher de Lénoncourt and passed on the degree of Grand Inspector. The letters of Mirecourt suggest that uh, he was the founder of the Parf uh, Parfait des Intéressements title, which was too expens expensive according to the brothers. Uh, Dubaray was a prisoner during the Seven Year War in Germany and was freed in 1761. So Dubaray was looming uh, and was maybe behind Le Boucher, Le Boucher de Le Noncourt, who received the Grand Inspector ti uh, title degree in Metz. Uh, there was two documents are kept in the library of the Grand Orient of France who confirmed confirm, uh, unequivocally the role played by Dubaray in disseminating uh, this, this series of degrees even before Mircourt. In 1764, Joseph Berthaud, the worshipful of L'Amitié in Strasbourg, uh, asked the well-known lodge uh, Le Condeur to get uh, regular constitutions in Paris. And to that end, he presented copies of his former constitutions, which were not, which were not right. Uh, dated from March 1763, they were signed by Dubaray, uh, Grand Worshipful and President of the Loge Saint-Jean de l'Union Parfaite. He found uh, Barthaud uh, perfectly instructed uh, on the, the first three degrees and other degrees such as uh, enter the apprentice, Scottish master, English master, uh, knight of the west, knight of the east, sublime Scottish and royal arch. Um, this is similar to what was uh, done in Mircourt six years later, and only the founder degree was missing, but it is to be found in another recently acquired document uh, by the museum. This time, it is a constitution, a, a letter of original constitution from January 1763, signed by Dubaray for Jean-Claude Mathias Dumainbourg, who was the venerable of a, a loge in Orléans in 1757. No, in our document, the grades, the degrees um, given to Dumainbourg are abbreviated, but we can recognize them.
So you have the whole series there um, that I just mentioned, and you all know the series of degrees. The patent also uh, talks about the authorities um, that Dubarai claimed. Um, here you can see the clear names of uh, the authorities that gave him, uh, confirmed him his legi legitimacy. Comte de Clermont, um, Millard Cavendish, the General Burke, the substitute of our TCF, the King of Prus. What was uh, Dubarai roles in creating this series of degrees? Because we know that he dissemin disseminated them in Mircourt and earlier in Metz through Le Boucher de Le Noncourt. As I've said earlier, the core of the degrees from the Master Perfect to Knight of the East is uh, matches uh, legit legitimately recognize higher degrees uh, in the second half of the 1750s. And Precourt gave a list to Meunier, uh, and it was a historic treaty on masonry uh, for his brethren in Metz, and he quotes nine degrees. Regarding the um, following degrees, as Gou and Bernheim said, the importation of Knights of the West and Royal Arch uh, were Im imported in Metz in 1761. Dubarai was stationed in next to Göteborg uh, in 1759, and he gave a, a Lieutenant Bjornberg both degrees when they were presented at the time as the last degrees of Swedish masonry. In Metz, uh, the Knights of uh, the West and Royal Arch were conferred successively, uh, but later on, a uh, sublime um, Scottish uh, came in between them. The Royal Arch of, du uh, of uh, Dubarain is one of the first proofs of the presence of the degree in France. The ultimate uh, degrees, the three ultimate degrees of uh, this series of, of the Met degrees were imported by Dubarai. And we know that for sure, but there's still a pending question. The origin of the most peculiar of those degrees, because it is, uh, it has nothing to do with the Masonic symbolic uh, references, and it is in a way the entry door to it, the founder uh, degree, which is part of the wood ma ma masonry. We know that in 1760 in Frankfurt, next to Hanau, where Dubarai uh, built the Le Boucher Lodge, another Frenchman. Uh, lived and operated. He was the head of uh, the Constance, uh, described as Meunier de, by, uh, by Meunier de Precourt as the most wonderful lodge of the universe because you could find the Prince Camille de Rouen, uh, the Marquis of Seignolet, the grand uh, being the grand son of Colbert, but also the brother of the Minister of the Foreign Affairs, uh, Charles François Radet. Knight of Beauchene, um that we have to credit with as early as 1747 of the Order of the Fondeur, uh, which was a leisurely society, but um, who wa which was based, uh, whose ritual was based on operative uh, sources. So the identity of the person behind the Lorraine uh, degrees is uh, still difficult. The Grand Inspector and the Knight of the West and the Royal Arch came from Dubarai, and the Fondeur degree came from Beauchen. It could have been recognized by Dubarai when he was stationed in An ha ha Hanau, where Le Boucher de Lenoncourt already had close ties with Beauchen. Based on uh, the um, structures, we can see that there were nine degrees, the nine degrees mentioned by Meunier de Precourt as early as 1750, the 1750s, 
and then above that the deg the degrees imported by Dubarai with the entry door um, of the high degrees of a founder from Beauchene. It could uh, reflect the presence of a contingent of uh, large masters uh, in Lorraine and Germany, bridging Lorraine and Germany. And this cont contingent was historically identified since Meunier de Tricourt du Barai, the Bouchet Knight, and Le Boucher de Lenoncourt were the core of an, al an, an alliance uh, driven by Meunier de Tricourt. He, uh, uh, in 1755, Five talked about a grand lodge um, uh, with the grand lodge about a project uh, for universal correspondence with all of the regular lodges so, so that we could uh, speak with one voice and adopt uh, one unique principle on the functioning and the way to do things in lodges and regarding the degrees. The dissemination of the Lorraine degrees uh, did not stop at Metz and Mircourt. We also find traces of them in the Duke capital, in uh, the Loge Saint-Joseph de Lunéville at the beginning of the 1760s, as shown by a manuscript that listed the degrees. This system was also practiced in Strasbourg uh, in civil, civilian and military lodges. Um, the it was uh, made regular by La, La Condeur Lodge. Uh, La Condeur was a very high aristocratic uh, lodge and was interested in our degrees. A manuscript belonging to Le Comte de Tressan, uh, whose son was a member of La Condeur, uh, shows the rituals. Um, uh, the military lodge of the Amitié uh, for the Strasbourg Regiment uh, comprised the General Leclerc de Landremont uh, at the beginning of the 1760s. There's a 1766 certificate that lists the degrees um, that are similar to the Lorraine degrees, including Le Fondeur. All of this constitutes a book of degrees with numbers that uh, strongly resembles uh, the degrees, uh, the Lorraine degrees. And the degrees also uh, were adopted on the other side of the Rhine River uh, in the French community in Berlin until the end of the 1770s and 1780s. The correspondence between uh, masons of the Royal York and saint charles lodges, including the comedian François Le Beau de Nantes and the brother Drouin, show uh, the circulation dissemination of some specific degrees. Uh, Maître Fondeur, Knight of uh, the West, Venerable, uh, Worshipful uh, Master of Lodges and other degrees. It's all nice and well, but what about Paris? The Lorraine uh, degrees were, did, was the only degree to be passed on uh, by Le Boucher, the last one. As early as May 1761, it uh, is a substitute of the Grand Master, the Chief of the Correspondent, the General Inspector of all regular lodges, but also the Keeper of the Seal and Archives. Le Boucher uh, was the person we were talking about, uh, and he also delivered constitutions, uh, and we are going to uh, study two of those, one to the Lodge Saint-Jean-de-Metz in March 1762, and one to the Lodge Saint-Jean-des-Frères-Discrets of Charleville. Let's take a look at the iconography uh, under the patronage uh, the of M M Minerva and Hercule, uh, wisdom and strength but that shows some particularities, such as this shining star at the center with a he Hebraic Beth rather than a G. Uh, this might look familiar to you because it is similar to a model uh, coming from lodges 
uh, where the Lorraine degrees were practiced, l'amitié and le parfait silence in the Strasbourg Orient. Those documents are um, a bit older. They date back to 1766 and 1772, and they are based on the same pr prototype as both constitutions delivered by the Grand Lodge in 1762. Um, Joan, uh, Joan Samuel Mund uh, was a painter and uh, drew, drew the prototype in 1760. The iconography and chronology were enough to indicate affiliation between uh, Bushen's documents and the constitution templates models uh, delivered by the Grand Lodge in 1762. But there's another clue. Uh, you can see a, um, a her Hercules uh, shield uh, with an axe, and this was originally a um, blazon Bushen's uh, coat of arms. Thanks to the talent of Johann Samuel Moon, the documents of Bushen and the Constance uh, are uh, some of the um, the most beautiful of this period. Uh, but did the Grand Lodge only use them because they look nice? Indeed, they are original uh, motives uh, that are very discreet but suggestive at the bottom of it. Um, that um, evoke the degrees uh, practiced by the institution. On the right, you can find the symbols of the Knight of uh, the West. And on the left side, you can see a running do dog that, and the degree of elect comes to mind. But their activity and their uh, hats uh, show them as being fondeur, the Bouchen degree that opened up to higher grades in the scale of degrees, just before uh, the elect degree. Uh, those drawings uh, were made by François Nicole in 1761, and it tells us a great deal. Nicole lived in Nancy, and it confirms the um, eastern origin of the matrix uh, when the Lorraine degrees were being disseminated at the regional level. Who, between 1761 and 1762, could have brought this, uh, these, uh, this drawing uh, from Lorraine to Paris to use it officially uh, with the authorization, the um, official authorization of the Grand Lodge, if not François Le Boucher de Lénoncourt, keeper of the seal? But we have another clue that corroborates this uh, theory. At the bottom of the constitutions, you can read a Latin uh, saying in labore quies, tranquility in work, in labor. But this um, slogan was used previously by a cardinal, the Count uh, Bishop of Metz during the 16th century, uh, named Robert de Lenoncourt, who even used it on uh, coins. How can we interpret this discrete presence of uh, the Lor uh, Lorraine degrees and uh, the, this slogan? The first reason could be uh, opportunistically reusing the document that was, that was dedicated to the organization um, by Le Boucher himself, but we have to be a bit more nu uh, nuanced about it. We can't find the same uh, iconography in the Bouchen and Le Boucher documentation. In the same way, the constitutions uh, show the Le Boucher slogan, but they are missing the partic uh, particular uh, sign of Bouchen, the systematic use of a divine name in three Hebraic letters, Yah. There is a Latin text. Um, above the opening door in the bush and the doc document that was added to uh, the constitutions of 1762 of the Grand Lodge. But the 
there are more signs of the Lorraine degrees in Paris than the degree of Grand Inspector and the documents, uh, the aforementioned documents. It left more affirmative uh, traces that can be found in a manuscript uh, about the, thir thirty, the um, 33 degree right that was attributed to the Comte de Clermont dating back to 1768. Uh, we find uh, some uh, Lorrain uh, degrees with identical rituals, uh, with, with rituals identical to Mircourt for a uh, sublime Scottish and the degree of royal arch and uh, uh, worshipful grand master of the lodge and grand inspector. The section about uh, the health is even more sign significant. The health will be the first of our um, king monarch, which who will be joined uh, by the king of Prussia, protector of all lodges. The second um, rule will be the one of the Count of Clermont. And finally, the Milord Revendita for Cavendish, uh, grandmaster of all um, English uh, lodges and the Brunsbury General, grandmaster of all uh, Swedish uh, lodges. Despite the changes, you can see the patrons, uh, Dubaray and Le Boucher, uh, claimed by Dubaray and Le Boucher de Lenoncourt. In between 1767 and 1769, Le Boucher de Lenoncourt is harder in the eye of the tornado. Um, because of the suspension of the Grand Lodge, he was uh, blamed with um, he had a, he played a huge part in the suspension of this Grand Lodge. We lost his trace uh, in 1769. The certificates of l'amitié uh, au régiment in Strasbourg of the or of the Parfait Silence in 1767 use the Beauchene iconography and bear the slogan Virtute Merue Lumen through virtue they deserved light. And they, it, it has been interp interpreted uh, through a moral lens, a bit abstract lens, but virtue was the name of the Le Boucher Lodge, uh, which had a similar slogan, Constantia Merue Lumen, through constant um, uh, coherence, they deserved light. And it was on the certificates uh, delivered by Beauchene in his lodge, La Constance. Everything shows that those slogans um, described uh, the organization uh, to which the lodges were affi affiliated. In 1773, in Le Lecce in Normandy, um, this was confirmed. A local lodge was created. Uh, and at this time, we already lost any trace of Le Boucher de Lenoncourt. One of the founders of the lodge um, asked a specific carving uh, with the slogan Virtute Merue Lumen with a delta, uh, with an emblem of Beauchene that was used later on by Le Boucher, a Hebraic Beth in, in uh, place of the G. The, the He co-signed the Morin patent that was delivered by the Great Council. It, uh, he uh, was with two prominent people who was affiliated to the Beauchene uh, branch, the Prince of Rouen and the Count of Choiseul that he was uh, close friends with. So uh, um, a third of the nine signatories of the Morin patent La Corne, Brest de la Chaussée, and Chaillon de Joinville. But Chaillon was also part of this branch through the Marquis of Seignolet, the protector of Beauchene and his predecessor uh, in this branch. It, it may be worth reminding you uh, that this grand council was a bit of an inner circle of the eminent uh, knights of Kadosh, but the Supreme Council was a modest predecessor of it. Um, Dubaray, uh, th that was uh, cr created undercover by Dubaray. And Meunier de Precourt wrote, uh, Dubaray 
had to signal his arbitrary power to erect this uh, Supreme Council. Um, and I, I'm certain that my brothers will ask me what a Supreme Council is. I did not know it. I'm, I, I learned of it, and I'm going to share this with them. Um, Dubarai uh, has a, a number of degrees. Uh, he claims to hold one directly from the Count of uh, Clermont. And this uh, degree took a new form, um, and he is uh, claiming to be able uh, to, uh, to, to transmit it. And I'd like to conclude um, on the following note. Among these grand in inspectors, uh, what are the traces of uh, the right of perfection? Now, the degrees within the right of perfection have reduced. The Knight of the West, uh, the worshipful uh, master, and hypothetically, the uh, royal arch. Um, now, the royal axe uh, is symbolically centered on uh, woodcutters in Lebanon. Now. The order of these degrees is very similar to what we see in Lorraine. In, the, in both of these cases, the Knight of the West comes after the Knight of the East, which is divided in two in the right of perfection. Um, and then in the uh, Lorraine uh, scale, uh, there are other uh, degrees as well. But in in the right of perfection, uh, the sublime uh, S Scott Mason was followed immediately by the worshipful Grand Master, uh, which was also true in the Lorraine scale from 1763, but uh, the Royal Arch also became a part of this uh, in, in the middle. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating, and you uh, have really contributed an additional piece of the puzzle because uh, we, we had a, a vague idea about this in the beginning, but over the last 20 years, we've been able to add all kinds of pieces to the puzzle. And thank you for sharing this quote, uh, this Precourt court on the Supreme Council. Uh, in France, it is a council supreme, but in English, it is a supreme council. Uh, and so, uh, of course, uh, in, in, in France, this was transposed as supreme council. And this goes back to, 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 to the 1700s and really shows uh, how this uh, line of thought came from Lorraine to Paris. Uh, Morin took it uh, to the West Indies, and then it was taken uh, to the United States. It returned. Uh, and so there, there are these very, very interesting, powerful aspects. Um, and this 1771 uh, quote on, I don't know what a Supreme Council is, but it has all kinds of powers and so on. And this document and all of these signatories, not only is it extremely interesting in substance, uh, but also its uh, iconography. Uh, so there's a bit of a sample here uh, the, uh, that, that you can see here at, 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 the, uh, at the bottom of the Constitution I showed you. Are there any uh, questions? Or should we move to the next presentation? Then we will come back to to this one. Now, I I, I wouldn't want to to uh, to to, uh, to to start the next presentation or the, the one after that too early. But yes, we're talking about uh, Frederick II and also the Count of Clermont, and the uh, commander at the time was supposed to represent uh, Frederick II and the lieutenant commander. Uh, the Count of Clermont. And so there is uh, interesting uh, symbolism at the end of uh, the 1700s and, and onwards. And so now we're going to move on uh, to um, uh, Arturo de Hoyos and Joe Wojcic.
presentation, please join me. They present plus at the OYO. Well, they need no introduction. Arturo de Hoyos is uh, the great uh, archivist uh, uh, of the southern jurisdiction for longer than I have been uh, archivist of the uh, Grand Torient. So he knows it extremely well. And uh, it's a bit of background to what you're going to hear is our American uh, brothers at the end of the 19th century uh, started uh, to, 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 to grow interested in uh, Masonic uh, manuscripts uh, when the French were not. Um, and it explains why uh, they have such a rich body of work. Now, there's a bit of a, a technical transition here. Uh, I do pray that it, it works if, 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 um, if that is something you tend to do. Now, uh, when you hear uh, a presentation like Laurent's, well, it, it, it gives you a lot of information, of course, but it's also a change of paradigm because until 30 or 40 years ago, the paradigm was, well, these, uh, these uh, Scottish degrees from the 18th century, well, they're completely chaotic, but actually, uh, you know, you, you you know, there's this idea that, that it's impossible to understand. There's a bit of a black box phenomenon. Sorry, I'm just uh, setting this up. Ah, le miracle est arrivé. Absolute miracle. No, Art and Joe need no introduction. Art is one of the greatest uh, historians, and he's the great archivist of the Southern jurisdiction and Joe is younger but he's a historian of the Scottish right and both of them um, uh, are able to read in several languages uh, Joe speaks French very well of course he's reluctant to do so uh, and speaks to me in English but he should speak more French and so this is a transnational uh, history and so it's it's very useful to speak many languages you have the floor to be here tonight we're actually very excited to present this uh, you heard earlier about uh, the Velo manuscript as the source of Franken and what we have here is what we believe is the earliest Franken manuscripts known uh, Franken's first act in in the United States that influ would later influence the creation of the Scottish Rite of course was when he created Moses Michael Hayes a deputy of the Order of the Royal Secret, which he did in December 69. Very soon after this, um, we have communication between them in the form of a letter, a, a couple of scribbled notes on some documents, and this collection of ritual books, which we call the 1769 Manuscripts. There's an additional one in a separate collection for 1770. But we have the majority of the degrees as translated and modified by Franken. And what we'll see is that it was Franken's work in some regards much more than Moran that led to the creation of the Order of the Royal Secret as we know it. So let's take a look at the collection first. <laughs> well, the first thing we have is this letter. Joe, uh, actually it's difficult for me to read with my I'll, glasses. Do you, do, you, do you want to read that or do you want to? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do it. Um, uh, it says, for, our, for Moses Michael Hayes, sir. Uh, you might want the computer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's get the date let's, on that first. Let's fix okay. That. There we are. Okay. It says, uh, sir and brother, in answer to your last, I can say with candor that the style of the degrees being not yet completed by Brother Morin, I am obliged to render them 
as careful and as fully as can be permitted by the use of the Cahiers. This alone, however, may not be enough to bring them to perfection, as they are still wanting in many details. Though I may say with confidence that they shall be brought to a state which shall add glory to the royal art, it being hitherto concealed, though I may also say without some small flattery that the work is a work indeed, which requires not only a constant attention to the mysteries of each degree, but an attachment to the whole system. If it can be perfected by a regular use by you and by your countrymen, I shall consider myself to have been repaid amply and fully. This being the true Scottish masonry, it has subsisted in various forms from the English, Prussians, and French, passing into the hands of Brother Morin by regular succession and sundry paths, so that the whole of the ancient and modern masonry may soon be worked and perfected here and add to that glory on both hemispheres. You will at once, my brother, perceive that the whole of this is depending upon the zealous and faithful labor of the grand elect masters and sublime. And this is the true, or is the whole history of the preservation of the name, the cubical agate stone, and the sum of the lost word of the ancient masters, which has been sought for since the time of Solomon and with in the rubble of the temple of Enoch, when Galaad was faithful to his post, a man so great as Hiram Abiff, and of whose history with, uh, be, f with be found by the grand elect, but for it all I comment you and your brother, uh, brethren sorry, to be anxious at once with the discharging of the work of the grand elect. Then we may engage upon the task of masonry renewed with the greater vigor put forward the actions in the recovered art till the whole shall be as a cloth without rent and further to the sublime princes and the ne plus ultra until the stage and post of the great camp shall be opened wide and the craft shall intend their standards within. Then we shall have framed the whole to inculcate the ancients, moderns, French, Prussians, and all who profess to the high degree, high and sublime masonry of Ecosse masters, which transmitted to us the sacred treasure of the guardians of the sacred boat. Uh, then the whole shall be gathered up into the chief and regular form, which was delivered by pieces into the hands of our brother Morin, who placed them with a charge into my own, as I do with you. I remain yours, Henry Andrew Franken. Now, this is a really remarkable document. There's just too much here to really unpack at one moment, but we can look at a couple of things. The first thing that really strikes me about this is the pure Masonic language of the ritual. Anybody who's familiar with the early Franken material can see how much he really borrows and amplifies uh, almost, I want to say almost a, a religious attachment to what is in the Masonic rituals in his recitation of the content of the degrees of the discovery and preservation of the name, his ideas that Ecosace Masonry is the most sublime thing comes out very obviously here. But importantly, uh, he uses the symbol of the camp, which we know was a creation or believe was a creation of Moran at the end, to show that this was to include all types of masonry, as he says, ancients, moderns, and uh, Prussians, but that he puts it all under a Scottish banner to create a complete system of masonry. He admits that Moran could not finish this or did not, but that he put it into his charge, and that Franken was doing the same thing on the American shore. He was entrusting Hayes, who was the first of his deputies, to continue with this work. Uh, as we continue to go through the documents, we'll discover what some of the things are that he alludes to. Joe was actually the person who, who, who observed what I thought was an enigmatic phrase, where he says that uh, he would be fully repaid. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Joe will explain what, what his theory is in here. Um, but I, I think also it's important that it looks like that Franken, who had spent time in America, was kind of banking on the success of building a system of masonry, a high degree masonry in the United States, and he emphasizes this by the regular use of you and by your countrymen. And it wasn't only for puritanical reasons, maybe that he was doing this, but for some <laughs> personal reasons also, which we'll discover in here. So let's go ahead and move on. 
Uh, the, the manuscript is actually a collection, unlike other manuscripts, Franken manuscripts, it's not bound in a single document. Unfortunately, it's not complete. We have most of the parts of this. Uh, in addition to these individual little notebooks, we also have a Tyler, which we'll see, but we're gonna go through that, and you can see all of them in collection, very typical for the degree work of the time. Yeah, so what we see here is the uh, first cahier contains the ninth degree, the 10th degree, the 11th degree and the 12th degree, and a separate cahier is gonna be the 14th degree. Go ahead. Yeah, and then the 15th degree, and then the princes of Jerusalem, the 16th degree. And what we wanna point out, to remember that this is the earliest known version of Franken, and we will see examples of emendations and corrections, but this matches the Balo manuscript closer to anything else and again the first time in the English language so we look at this as the Fons et Arrigo of what ultimately becomes the Scottish Rite. We'll continue and look at some other manuscripts. And there's even like French artifacts in these too like they're little like phrases and words that are still left in there that are not fully rendered. That, that, that's right as we saw in the letter even though Franklin was very competent in English every once in a while he uses language that shows that uh, it's, it's obvious to an English reader <laughs> that, that it was a foreigner that was writing in English. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got our uh, 17th degree cahier, and then we have another cahier of the 18th degree and the 22nd degree. Right, and here we see our first indication of something really interesting. When we said that Franken had more to do with the order or the construction of the order of the royal secret, we will see a couple of places where the traditional order of the degrees wasn't preserved, but was actually created by Franken. He wasn't sure which degree would take which number, so he labels the degree one, and as he worked on the other degrees, he would go back and renumber it. He would cross it out or even erase it, and then renumber the degree. Then we have uh, the 19th and 20th degree in a cahier, uh, followed by the uh, 21st degree Right, and that, that's going, my eyes are kind of bad. 24. I said, oh, okay, that's what he, <laughs> I'm an older man than he is. It's more <laughs> difficult for me to read. Yeah, so we have the 24th degree, and then on the right is, is the Tyler's Manual. What's interesting is it only goes up to the 24th degree, of course, because the bodies that would be created would not have the authority to confer that 25th degree at this point. Right, and it, it appears that like the uh, 25th degree is reserved for deputies only. Absolutely. So it, what's interesting is even though this went to Hayes as a deputy, we don't know at what point Franken actually gave that ritual to him. We get a hint as to how's this, how this material was going to him uh, because there's, there is note on here that's dated, as we'll see. And he also drops a hint, too, like in that letter about the camps opening wide. And that, that's right, mm -hmm. and, uh, using the language of the 25th degree. That's right. Exactly. Okay, so we've got the uh, 19th degree and the 22nd degree, but this is in a separate uh, uh, collection that's in a Grand Lodge in the U.S., um, and, and this one's actually dated, and it says August uh, 1770 on this particular copy. Um, the other thing that it has is the uh, hieroglyphics alphabetical, and, and we'll see here in a minute what that actually means. And one of the things that's important to note is that Franken appears to have made multiple copies of the same degrees, or perhaps emendations of it, which he sent to Hayes. Now, he would, of course, make other deputies, but I think at this point he was banking on Hayes being the person mm. that was taking control of what would be the right in the United States. Okay, so we want to talk just for a second here and give you some examples of the Cahiers uh, illustrations and we maybe have a look at how that might compare to Balo. Yeah, this is amazing. All you have to do is, you can see the illustrations right here is that he literally lifts it and adds it. Now, Joe, if I'm not mistaken, this square was taken from another degree. That's right, it came right out of the 14th degree, and so Franken, he reorders it and takes the square of 81, that we see in other French texts, and moves it into the 15th degree here. That's right, didn't we see an example of this square in an earlier ritual today, I, I, th believe? I think maybe an hour ago. Yes, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. So we see him, again, not Moran, but we see Franken doing the actual translation and transposition of material to create the degrees as they uh, later came into the Scottish Rite. Okay, so we also see here this uh, particular image on the left is uh, Chevalier du Rosquois, 
but it's, um, it's from a separate manuscript. So in the Balo text itself, it appears that it's been extracted from a separate manuscript and uh, pasted in by the owner. Yeah, and Franken's remarkable drawing is this is the first time that we see this jewel in the 18th degree. And if you look at it, like, I mean, it's obvious on the, the jewel on the left, it's, that's the one, and then it's that on the other. But he's just put the uh, pelican on the actual cross itself, showing the obverse of the jewel. Yeah, and I've always thought it curious that he puts it in the 1769 version, but the jewel does not appear in the other Franken manuscripts. Mm -hmm. I have not seen it in an, Have you seen it in I've another copy? I've never seen it in anything. Any, anything else, right? So this is, this is very extraordinary. So. Ah, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, uh, what? You want me get it? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Get a drink and I'll talk. <laughs> so this one on the left is a uh, Prussian knight from the Balo manuscript. And then what we see is in the Franken, uh, same thing. He's added letters to the jewel, um, but it's the letters from the ritual. It's the passwords. That, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, this is one of the remarkable things where we'll see a later example of an emendation. We can see that he took the jewel of the degree directly. It's reversed, but we'll find in a later manuscript that he flips it over and, and does both sides of it. But this shows how closely that he, he must have been working from this document, and we will have proof positive of that. If, it, if it's not shown only by the illustrations here, we're going to come to the proof later. We're going to get to concrete evidence. That's right. <laughs> okay, so... We're going to look at the Knight's Kadosh here. Um, you see the classical form. Um, in earlier degrees, the, the Kadosh ritual, there was a, a grand elected knights <clears throat> in that uh, Quimper Kadosh manuscript from 49. And in some of these texts, you see on the left the classical form of the latter. And Franken really is the first to make the new form. That's right. And one of the things that we notice is that although Franken created bodies in Albany in 1767, is they did not really use the ladder in the form that Franken has it, but they got it from other sources, other French sources. So we don't have evidence that the Albany bodies were really using the corrected, I guess we could say, like Franken versions of the ritual. They may have been using earlier versions. We haven't found those manuscripts yet. Uh, but this is the last time the manuscript on the left is the last time that the ladder appears, yeah, at least in the Western Hemisphere, in this form. Uh, the, after this, all of the manuscripts use the Franken version of it. And this one's really unique, too, because they actually count the rungs of the ladder in this one. I don't see that in some of the classical texts, except for, of course, in Balo. That, that's right, borrowed from there. Okay. Um, we've got in the 11th and 12th degree in the Tyler's manual, we see uh, examples of the jewel. Uh, the particular jewel on the left um, in the, the Ahmed Franken manuscript, I think that's an 86, that same image appears in that one also. Yeah, although lacking from the others. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only time it appears there. Yeah. Yeah, and here again, this is from this separate collection, the one that's in, in the Grand Lodge. Unfortunately, they have only one, uh, one single uh, notebook. Uh, but it's important because we can compare it with the one from the 1769 collection and see that as recently as within a year, mm -hmm. he was continuing to work on it and send them to, Frank, to uh, Hayes. But there's, there's the jewel. Okay. Uh, so we're looking again at the same text, but we're now comparing it for not from the 1769, but to the 1770, and we see a little bit of change here, don't we? We do. And uh, in particular, we'll take notice of those symbols that are to the side of the axe, uh, because those are going to be a clue as to the sources that Franken had. Mm -hmm. Oh, it knocked oh, out. That was an extra slide there. All right. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to look at evidence uh, for drafts that this is like really like a draft copy, a working copy. Yeah, I mean, it's very obvious here. You can see not only on the cover page, but you can see his renumbering at the top that it's 18 and 19 at the same time. And this happens in a couple of the degrees. So this is why we say we know that it was Franken who, who put the rituals in the order that we have them today. He just, I guess at some point, had to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> Executive decision time. Right. Yeah, and then we see, you know, whole lines struck out through this uh, text, and like, you know, he's, he's erasing words. It's just more evidence that he's, he's, it's a working and a living document. Right, but again, this manuscript matches the language of Balo closer than anything else. 
Uh, the changes that he makes we find in the later versions of the Franken manuscript, which means that he was working, he made his improvements. He didn't bother to correct and create a new uh, uh, notebook. He simply sent these versions to Hayes with the hope that he would continue. Exactly. Okay, and again, more examples here. We've even got him writing in the margin now where he's ran out of space. That's the same thing. I'm going to wait for another image right here. There you go, dating. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this is one of the more remarkable things because at the, at the left hand page, I am not sure what he, he scratched out. I've put light behind the original document. I've used alternative light sources, different frequencies of light, uh, but he used the same ink, unfortunately, that he used to write the manuscript. So we don't yet know what he felt very strongly of omitting in there. <laughs> but we, fortunately, preserved at the bottom, he tells Hayes that he's going to send him the 19th, 20th, 21st documents here. Uh, but he actually dates it on the very bottom of it, just simply June 3rd. Now, since we know uh, that the letter, uh, that we have the date of the letter, and we know that, that um, uh, Hayes was created a deputy uh, in 1768, we know that this document, again, must date from 1769. Right, and so w when you take these dates and he puts the 19th and 21st degree into context, using it with other pieces here, and then also a timeline we'll elaborate on here in a moment, um, we're able to kind of put all these texts in order and, and get a sense on the ones that aren't dated. Yeah, we'll be able to see what Franken was doing at what time and have some reasons as to where he was when he did these documents. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, so what we see here is that um, I took the uh, Albany Lodge of Perfection uh, minute book and laid out who all received degrees and when they received them to kind of get an idea of what did Marin, or not Marin, sorry, Franken have with him in uh, New York. Like, what did he take with him? And what we see is that if these revisions are happening in 1769, rituals uh, going on before April of this time uh, will be materials that he had on hand with him. So we see that he was roughly conferring the fourth through the sixth degree before December of 65 that he had this ritual in his possession in English to confer. Same thing with the 13th through the 16th degree. So the question is, if you had earlier copies of the ritual, where are they? Yeah, and what were they? <laughs> yeah, what were they, exactly. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that you touched it. Okay. So uh, this manuscript has something very odd that none of the others have in them, and it's an obligation for the twenty-fourth degree uh, to be taken by Hebrews. And it makes sense that it it's, needs to be something special because effectively they're becoming Knights Templar, which would would appear to be against their faith. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it aloud if you sure. like. Okay, so it says, I, my name, do swear by the great God Adonai, the God of our forefather, I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that I will be inviolable in my religion and never reveal the secrets of grand elected knights of Kadosh to any person, to revenge masonry on the traitors, and never to receive to this degree, but only a brother who has, by degrees, come to the degree of Knight of the Sun or Chaos Disentangled, which is the title in Balo, mm -hmm. uh, and then by an authority given uh, me by a grand commander under his hand and seal, I promise to be ready at all times to conquer the Holy Land when I shall be summoned to appear to pay due regard at all times to the mandates of the sublime princes of the royal secret. And if I fail in this my obligation, I wish that the plagues of Egypt may torment my body and may my soul remain wandering and never enter the book of life, but be cut off as a Korath and his companions and be excommunicated from the circumcised and never be numbered <laughs> among the children of Israel. So help me God with the hand of truth and faith. Amen. It's kind of severe, isn't <laughs> that it? That is extremely <laughs> That's severe. That's a heck of an obligation. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I, I thought it interesting that there's almost a corollary to this in the original Dalco version of the 33rd degree. I'm working on a document mm. uh, on, on that, and there's something something similar to this in there. Fantastic. Also. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're going to show you how uh, some more connections from Balo to Franken. Okay, uh, when we talked about the sublime characters and showed you the axe or the royal axe that had those characters on it, 
what it was is the sublime characters, what we believe were Chinese characters, we don't know where they were copied from, but they were used as uh, symbols in place of the passwords or the secret words of the degree. And so what we have is a list of the passwords with the Chinese characters that they represented and they are numbered and we'll be able to correspond or, or see how those correspond to uh, what's in Franken's manuscript. Now again, what's important is this is the, uh, the strongest evidence that connects Balo to Franken because they're the only two Masonic documents that have these characters and the words fit perfectly. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so we have the uh, hieroglyphics alphabetical. Um, it's got the numbers in there, and if you'll look at it, it, they're out of order. So it's not numbered sequentially. What he's done is he's gone back through, uh, regrouped them alphabetically, and assigned the corresponding number to the left. Okay. Yep, and so here we see examples from the, two, uh, the uh, 22nd degree where you can see uh, that he includes the password on the left for a, a couple of passwords, but for some odd reason he decides to put in the, the, the symbol that represents the word, and the same thing on the right. And, and then we're going to have an example to show how that's decrypted. Okay, so we see an example of them also in the 1769 franken Cahiers, where they're again using the same logograms right out of the back of Balo. Exactly. And here's the key to it. When we look at what was in uh, Balo and compare it with Frank, and we see that they match exactly, uh, which we look at as, of course, proof positive that that, that was the key to uh, the ritual and the source of it. And I, th I think it's 100% conclusive. Uh, again, another example of the same thing. Yeah, so not only do you get the same acts in the image, but you also get, again, the same characters exact that characters. correspond. Yep. And another example. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get those characters translated to know if they even have any meaning. Um, it could be that they were just simply copied off a document uh, because they were something exotic and a logogram that people would not recognize. Exactly, and if you look at how difficult and complex those were, it becomes obvious why they weren't used later because it's just impossible. Yeah, it became impossible, and this is one of the things of the later, not only Franken manuscripts, but the early Scottish Rite documents, of course, in the United States, is that none of them had encrypted passwords, they were all very plain following the Franken style. So what we see are examples then, um, if you'll look to the if you look through the document, there's not uh, there's numbers that have been added, and the handwriting doesn't match in the back of it. But when you compare it to Franken's English handwriting, the characters are extremely close. So we may have evidence here of Franken's handwriting inside the Balo manuscript itself. Again, so not just the fact that it's borrowed, but it looks like we've got his handwriting. Right, and also if you if you look at the image on the left there, you'll see an additional list of names added to the bottom that don't have corresponding logograms. So the original list of logograms is even expanded that, by Franken. That's, that's right. So kind of like a summary of like the, you know, the hieroglyphics alphabetical versus the sublime characters. Uh, the characters sublime or hieroglyphics alphabetical were intended to be logograms used in the ritual text and appear only in the 22nd degree in both the 1769 and 1770 versions. Yeah, I'll read that. And Franken expanded the list of the numbers from the Bela manuscript. The numbers appear to be substituted for the logograms in 1770, so he's moving away from this practice. And neither appear in the 1771 copy of the Grand Lodge of England, uh, Grand Lodge of England, Wales. And they were likely discarded, as Joe mentioned, simply because they were impractical. They were mm. just too tough to use. Good idea, bad example. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so some, some more proof. Um, According to the December 20th, 1767 Albany Lodge of Perfection patent, the source ritual has 29 degrees because it says from secret master to the 29th degree. But if we remember correctly... Well, before we just say that, um, previous Masonic historians have written about this patent and said it must have simply been a slip of the mind and a mistake. Franken must have meant the 25th degree. Mm. Well, when Joe took a look at the uh, Balo manuscript and said, Let's see if that's true. And <laughs> what we discovered was it wasn't. It was the number of degrees that were in the Balo manuscript. So at the time that that patent was issued, mm -hmm. he intended on using the degrees as they existed in Balo 
previous to his revisions and amplification of the system. Right, so he travels with a handful of the degrees in English with the intent of doing the whole system. Um, and if you look at these two numbers, number 30 and number 31, these were copied in uh, on May the 9th in 1768. So at the time that Franken was in New York, uh, staying up in uh, New York City and starting the Albany Lodge of Perfection, there were more degrees, the Cohen degrees, were being copied in, uh, in May of 68 in Port-au-Prince. Right, but the degrees that he had, the 1 through 29, corresponded to what he intended to confer, so he issued a patent for the full authority of those 29 degrees. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so just to kind of put it all into context here, um, as we mentioned before, in December 8th of 65, Franken and his future wife are attending the christening of uh, Nicholas and Sarah Love's daughter, Johanna. Uh, by August 22nd of 67, we see Marat issuing, issuing a patent to uh, Guillaume Alexis Delma and Le Quay in Saint-Domingue. And this is at the same time that Franken is up in New York as well. Um, by October uh, 7th, Franken meets William Gamble and Francis Pfister of Union Lodge in Albany in New York City and confers uh, 4 through 14 on them, but it's probably just the 14th degree. Right, and so he's thinking only of the primitive system at this time, not the order of the world secret as we know it. That's right, and so they come back the following week and he confers on them the 15th degree and the 16th degree um, and gives them a draft constitution to establish a lodge of perfection. So it's just simply a piece of paper, it's not that fancy one. That's right. Okay, by 17, end of October 1767, we see that he confers the degrees of the lodge of perfection on swords and lintot in New York City. Uh, by, and just soon after that in November, the provisional constitution of the Albany Lodge of Perfection copied in the 1771 manuscript. That's right. Uh, again, just again, the next month uh, in December uh, is the date of the fair copy of the Albany Lodge of Perfection constitution that William Gamble had, which is, is the most famous in the United States. And in 1767, the petition for the land grant, which turns out to be something very interesting and helps to answer one of the questions we had regarding the letter at the beginning uh, that he sent to Hayes. There's, it's not dated. Uh, do you want to take this over? Do you know about the land oh, grant yes, a little oh, yes. bit? This is fun. Okay, so in 67, uh, we, we, I found a land petition for that Franken and uh, Cornelius P. Love uh, were applying for 2,000 acres of land on the western frontier of Ulster County. No indication if he received it or not, but I think likely he did because it is recorded in the book. Okay, so by uh, February 3rd of 1768, Franken is naturalized in the province of New York, and the following month on March the 2nd, he petitions for a land grant of 5,500 acres with John Marin Scott uh, and Martin Van Bergen and their associates. This is a massive amount of land that he's been granted here. And I did a little bit more digging, and it turns out that before he left, he received 300 acres uh, adjacent to his son, Parker Bennett Franken, uh, but who was also like a small child at this point. So he, he's double dipping, and he's got two land grants in Jamaica, probably both for 300. And things aren't going to turn out good. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, so. okay, so we see in June, uh, Franken signing the Night of the Sun patent for Jeremiah Van Rensselaer. Uh, and it, but he probably signs it later that month because he visits on St. John's Day for the first time the Albany Lodge of Perfection. Oh, oh yeah, so this is an example of that patent that uh, Franken gives to Hayes, and I'd like to point out that it's not the original. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, Hayes says that it's because he's lost the original, right. and so he's made a copy of the text. Good. December 6th. Franken confers the 25th degree. This is where he makes Hayes a deputy inspector general in New York City. And again, we don't really know what his intent is at this time because it looks like he's banking on Hayes as from that letter, that, that he, he's investing Hayes with the powers that he has. Like he said, he similarly received it from Moran and that he wants it to be expanded by he and his countrymen in, in order to be amply repaid. That's so right. that, that's gonna be an important phrase there. So we see soon thereafter, that uh, he has to flee. <laughs> yeah. Now, didn't you say that there were, or did we list here about the un, the uh, letters? 
that are left in the post office or not? Oh, yeah, that's uh, the next slide. Oh, okay. All okay. Right. No, so uh, what ends up happening, though, he, he gives uh, the 24th degree to Samuel Stringer, and what he's doing is Samuel Stringer is the worshipful master of the Albany Lodge of Perfection. So for the local leadership, they can get up to the 24th degree. Um, it's just, you know, more, but there, again, they're only supposed to be a lodge of perfection. So he's uh, giving the 24th degree to local leadership. By April the 17th, uh, Franken flees New York with his pregnant wife, leaving his possessions behind. Um, it, the, my thinking is, is he borrowed against the land and then defaulted. He, he couldn't pay it off. That's right. And then later we'll see that the land was sold in uh, 1770. And so then we see in July, he writes to Hayes. Oh, this is the uh, example here of the, uh, the thing. So it says, several rich clothes, the property of a gentleman absconding at the house of Henry Andrew Franken, Esquire, near the New Dutch Church, the household furniture of that gentleman who departs the province. So we, we can look at Franken perhaps like uh, James Anderson. In this case, he wanted to avoid going into debtor's prison. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so in August, um, we see the birth of Mary Long Franken, and when you do the math, if, he, if he's having his stuff sold in April, he's leaving with a pregnant wife, and so he was in very bad trouble, it seems. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, so, so by October the 10th of 69, Franken, uh, we see his letters uh, remaining in the general post office, just more proof that he's not there. He's not coming back as far as he knows. <laughs> yeah, he's not coming back at all. Um, and then uh, in 69 here, we're not sure of the date because it appears, and I believe, if, if I remember correctly, the 83 Franken, um, it says that Grand Inspector Stephen Marin informs the consistory That's that right. uh, the 24th degree, were, they were no longer Knights Kadosh, but instead Knights of the White and Black Eagle. It's important because if you look at the uh, 69 text of that 24th degree, it's got the old name, not that, the new name. That's correct. And then in uh, April 1770, the Constitution for the Grand Chapters of the Prince of the Royal Secret, or Neg Plus Ultra, Grand Chapters formed by Moran in, in Kingston. He appoints Frank and his deputy, William Winter, the president and grand commander. Okay, okay so uh, June the 1st, Moran makes uh, Charles uh, Minister de Boissy Seneschal of the Royal Jurisdiction of Jacques Mel and Master of the Lodge Le Choix de Homme a 25th degree deputy inspector general. And so this is uh, Marin actually bringing this lodge into the order of the royal secret, which kind of like parallels with, a, with another little side project we're doing to, to visualize the lodges in San Domingue. Uh, by St. John's Day, um, the statutes and regulations of a lodge of perfection are received from Franken in Jamaica and Red and Lodge in Albany. And this is all according to the Albany Lodge of Perfection minutes. So even though Franken is gone, he's still banking on something happening, literally banking on something happening in Albany. And what is that? <laughs> well, what, 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 he, what, he's, what he's banking on is that it's going to be successful and that so probably what's happening here is like he's giving this patent to him, but he's foregoing the expense of it. That's, that's what we believe, this, which is why he says in his letter to Hayes that if that Hayes can actually make it work with his countrymen, he'll be amply repaid because he's actually looking for money in order to pay off his debts. Right, and so we see the uh, return of a survey for 6,000 acres. It says 6,000, it was uh, 5,500 in the document before. Uh, needless to say though, it's the same piece of land because it has the same names attached to it. Um, so we see by July 11th, they sell the land to recover their money. And by August, uh, Franken sends the 19th and 22nd degrees to Hayes. Okay, okay. in August, Franken sends the 15th to 25th to the Grand Lodge of England and Wales, that's the manuscript. And then by November 17th, unfortunately, Moran is dead. That's right. And so it's all in Franken's hands at this point, and he's buried in Kingston. On uh, April 19th, 1773, uh, Johanna Franken dies in Kingston. She's buried in the Kingston Parish Yard. In October of 1783, Franken's last manuscript revision survives. This is the one, of course, that's owned by the Northern Masonic Jurisdiction in the United States. Beautiful copy, fantastic copy. Um, it's the full re revised ritual book uh, for Jamaica, and something happens to the grand chapter between 1783 and 90. Franken's completely destitute, and Moses Cohen is sent to Jamaica to try to restart the grand chapter by Baron Spitzer of Charleston, 1790. Mm -hmm. So really what it brings to question is we've, we've shown you guys the evidence, uh, I mean multiple points of evidence here like that. It's starting to look conclusive that the Balo manuscript is in fact the Marin manuscript. Absolutely. So again, the point being is that although this manuscript was owned by Moran, 
it was, must have also passed into the hands of Franken, who used it to tr not only translate the degrees, but to modify them in the form that became the order of the royal secret. He not only modified the text, but he mod uh, modified the degree order. And it looks like his intent was initially to set it up in the United States, perhaps with the intent of paying off some personal debts, <laughs> uh, but that uh, uh, he continued to appoint, of course, other deputies after, or deputies were appointed after this too. I don't know if it, did he ever wind up paying off these debts, Joe? No idea. I know. <laughs> okay. And that pretty much concludes our presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Merci bien. Alors, ça donne un statut encore. Thanks a lot. So the Bailu manuscript becomes even more important because is it wouldn't wouldn't be it's not a testament um, of Morin, but it's Morin's document himself. It's this manuscript uh, in in and of itself. I wanted to add something on the Chinese uh, characters, uh, which is quite mi mysterious. It, might seem quite weird to us. But in the 18th century in France, uh, there were a lot of debates uh, on China. It was a religious quarrel uh, between the Jesuits and the Dominicans regarding rights. But it gathered a lot of interest in Europe. Many books were written about it. And those uh, Chinese characters uh, uh, come from European books, uh, most probably. Another thing might uh, seem weird to us today, but the discovery of Chinese culture uh, made quite an impact um, on public opinion at the time because it was completely different to uh, from ours. Even if the, um, the other cultures we discovered were foreign and far removed, there were some connections, but this time it's not the case. Uh, some words are used in the 18th century, for example, the Chinese and some more uh, derogatory terms today in today's language. So many theories have been written about it. So, sorry, the Chinois are associated to the Noachid, who are supposed to have received the revelation first. That is why esotericism used those Chinese characters. I could go on uh, for hours uh, on uh, your presentation because it's fascinating. And Laurent maybe gave us an answer to one mysterious element, the royal arch issue, the Prince of Lebanon. For the Franken manuscript and the Bailo manuscripts are the only manuscripts where this degree exists. Among uh, the thousands of manuscripts uh, regarding high degrees um, that can be found in the BNF in the National Library, there's absolutely no mention of the Royal Arch uh, Prince of Lebanon degree. So, and it will make quite an impact uh, on future generations. Laurent maybe gave us an explanation with the Fondeur degree. Morin might thought that uh, Fondeur was too modest and decided to um, take up the speed and turn it into a prince of Lebanon, which sounds better. So I can guess that you have uh, questions and feel free to ask them, of course. It's quite a technical topic. Uh, yes. Comme les, les nouvelles découvertes suscitent toujours un certain. But it is difficult to react to such new discoveries. You've, you just heard that, wow, we have another additional um, Franken manuscript, so what can be said after that? I might repeat myself, but we are slightly finding uh, the. Um, the missing pieces of the of the puzzle before that it was all chaotic and with. Um, gave it a good shake, and a brand new system came out of it. And it is much more serious and legitimate. When we don't know things, uh, we have preconceived ideas about them. And the these ideas were rather hostile towards the higher uh, degrees. 
French, um, Americans, and um, English um, Masons agreed on that. Um, Blue Lodges were the noblest masonry, and the Scottish um, degrees were just an addendum. Those degrees are old. Uh, they appeared uh, after, right after this, uh, the emergence of speculative masonry, masonry as we've seen yes, yesterday. And later on, there's an esoteric masonry project that is really cohesive. In any case, we will ask more questions and exchanges later on. And I will now give the floor to our third panelist, Arved Hubler, who will tell us about another myth, uh, a quite ancient myth, the role of Frederick the Great in a Scottish masonry and the Scottish Rite. So please pray with me so that the projector works. Alors, il y a un autre sujet, d'ailleurs. We've broached another issue yesterday among specialists. So there's the Bailo, Franken, and in the US, um, Franken mostly. But there was um, a, a matter regarding Franken in France uh, as well, because we also find traces of it uh, at the beginning of masonry in France. So hallelujah, it works for the third time. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's the uh, last lecture after a long day of uh, very exciting presentations. And I want to contribute a small issue to our discussions about the history of Scottish Rite. Um, Frederick the Great um, and his so sorry Frederick the Great um, my presentation is based on a book which was published in our research atelier in Berlin recently uh, this year, and I will um, tell some of the story uh, um, to uh, discuss a link between Frederick the Great and the Scottish riot. Uh, that's a long... It doesn't work. It's a long uh, uh, story which is discussed. Um, Frederick the Great, we have to... So no, it might. <laughs> Sorry for this uh, difficulties. So um, the history of um, the Scottish Rite, as we know, uh, started really with the uh, uh, year 1802. And before we talk about the prehistory of Scottish Rite, and um, I don't go in all these details. We have heard here the. Um, story how um, the documents were transferred from um, France, maybe from Bordeaux, to uh, the Caribbean islands and later to Charleston. I want to focus on this guy, Frederick the Great, <coughs> who lived in this area of the prehistory of Scottish uh, right. And um, his uh, lifetime could be divided in three parts, um, his younger uh, youth, and then uh, the king at war, where he was in three Silesian wars, 
and uh, then the king at peace. And um, this environment, this um, uh, war in the background of his life is very important um, uh, for the timeline. So what is about the link? I think it's uh, discussed very often um, that in the constitutions um, we have some, um, some uh, text in the first constitution, um, uh, Berlin, Paris and Bordeaux and sometimes uh, Berlin and Paris is mentioned. Um, I don't uh, discuss maybe differences in the different manuscripts, but in general you find um, all these um, uh, uh, places. And then in the second uh, grand constitution of 1786, we have um, uh, Frederick mentioned several times um, um, in, in a detailed way sometimes with some mistakes. For example, he never was called Charles, but it is written in this text, so there are um, uh, some mistakes. Also here we have a sample in this constitutions where explicit uh, we, we uh, uh, read done at the royal residence in Berlin, 1st of May um, uh, 1786. So in a way, um, uh, there is no doubt uh, in this document he is involved, but um, the question is, is this true? And um, there were in the past, in the 19th century, several um, questions from uh, different American uh, bodies to the Berlin Lodge of the Three Globes um, to, to prove this and to give some evidence. but. Uh, um, answer was always no, this connection is totally unthinkable. And um, um, after Pike has written a, a, a book about this uh, topic uh, in Germany, 1913, a German Masonic historian, uh, Wilhelm Begemann, also published a book uh, dealing only with this uh, Frederick and Scottish right link. And uh, he called uh, this story as a decade old American superstition. And um, <clears throat> uh, then he has also some very angry comments about Pike and the Americans who cover the German king uh, for their purposes. So it was uh, 1913, uh, so it was uh, a period of national um, furor in Germany. So um, that is the state today. Um, I think uh, it is a general accepted uh, knowledge that these two constitutions, especially the Grand Constitution, are not true in this way as they are written. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, non-logic um, um, elements inside the, the Signatures are not uh, really uh, uh, logically the people which are named there. So it seems that this is, uh, is a might, it's, it's uh, nothing true. And um, uh, for example, in Germany, all the people, uh, the, the brethren, don't know about this uh, theory or this idea. So it's forgotten in a way. But the hypothesis I want to present here and, and discuss a little bit is that there might be a kernel of truth in this, and I want to explain why uh, and what. So um, first, uh, some very short in background information to uh, this Frederick this, the Great. He became uh, one of the early Masons in Germany. Um, there was a, a accidental but very famous lunch between him and uh, a count of Schaumburg Lippe. And this uh, count uh, was a member of the uh, scientific horn lodge in London very early. And uh, so he was an enthusiastic Freemason and he was fighting with the father of the Prince Frederick uh, and was supporting Freemason uh, Freemasonry, and after this experience, uh, Frederick joined Freemasonry. He was accepted by the Lodge of Hamburg, and immediately he started to um, uh, 
establish her own so-called Lodge Premier in his uh, palace uh, far away from, uh, from Berlin. And after uh, he was coronated, uh, had the coronation and he became king, um, he established a Lodge du Roy, uh, a royal lodge in his uh, uh, palace in Charlottenburg close to Berlin. And he also was working for uh, some certain sessions, so it is proved that he um, uh, accepted um, one of his relatives in a, in a, um, in a ritual work. Um, <clears throat> Immediately after he was uh, a king, he started his first war, uh, 1740, and before he started this war, he uh, um, instructed his secretary to um, found a civilian lodge, which was uh, not royal, but by citizens. This uh, first lodge in Berlin, uh, or Trois Globe, uh, the three globes. And um, this lodge was um, <coughs> uh, not uh, a lodge of Frederick in this sense, he only um, um, allowed to establish his lodge, but he was not a member, he was not visiting this lodge, and he had in the later times more trouble with this lodge than uh, does he like this lodge. Um, on the other hand, um, um, he was in the war, and um, so most scholars today claim that he was uh, not longer interested in uh, masonry. But um, 1741, a diplomatic delegation of Frederick was uh, in London. They were looking for support for this Slesian war, political support, uh, but they also visit the Eng English uh, Grand Lodge, uh, where by the installation of the new Grand Master, and they had negotiations. Um, and finally, they were successful, and Frederick um, got the status of a natural sovereign grandmaster. So that means he was not, in a way, depending from the, United, from the Grand Lodge uh, of London. And um, so maybe that was also an attractive um, attribute um, for, for uh, Masons, which were granted by, by Frederick. Um, <clears throat> Very early, and that was uh, uh, done by, by your work and published, um, uh, there is uh, uh, also the Scottish Rite in Berlin. Um, um, uh, 1742, we uh, know that there was a Scottish lodge, and um, that created some trouble in, in Berlin uh, between the French-speaking um, uh, brothers and German speaking, and there was a separation between um, this, uh, so this Scottish lodge, which came from, from London, um, switched to a um, French speaking um, lodge. Um, it was working a decade, and then with the Third Slesian War, the Seven uh, Years' War, um, it was closed down because all French people, or most of the French people, uh, were um, uh, leaving Berlin because uh, France was on the uh, ally to the enemy, to the Austrian uh, um, uh, emperor, and um, therefore um, they had no good position in Berlin, and this lodge was closed down, and these uh, degrees, the Scottish degrees, were implemented in this German, now in German, titled uh, Mother Lodge uh, through the three globes. So that means, as a first result, there was a Scottish rite very early in Berlin uh, and uh, known under the uh, Berlin Masons, and there was uh, definitely an interest of Frederick in ongoing Masonic activities. So, um, um, uh, when he was negotiating or his, his um, officers were negotiating in London with the Grand Lodge. Um, so there is another um, link and that we have learned here in the previous uh, talks 
that there is um, um, also a Prussian knight, uh, knight and um, uh, Frederick mentioned in the different manuscripts. Um, I don't go into the details, we have heard it before. But there is some um, other interesting topic, and that is a book which was um, published in uh, 1766. It's uh, the most secret mysteries um, of the high grades of masonry. And uh, this book, you can find a copy uh, uh, one floor uh, lower in the lower floor in, uh, in display. This book uh, was uh, uh, in, in French and it um, introduced uh, in the seventh grade um, uh, this Chevalier Prussian, this uh, Prussian knight in the same way as in the other um, doc uh, documents and we have seen here and this uh, book also has a link to uh, the Roy of Prussia. Um, there is a discussion um, who is uh, the author of this book. In the book there is a person call, uh, um, named uh, de Berage, um, who is uh, named as an inspector general of the Prussian lodges in France. Um, but nobody knows him, so it seems that must be a pseudonym. And uh, there is a possibility that that is a German book uh, uh, pretending to be French, or it's a French source who um, uh, has knowledge of Prussian. Um, today, we could say that there is an author um, uh, known. It is a person called Karl Friedrich Köppen. And um, there are different uh, proofs that he has uh, written this book and published this book in Berlin. Uh, there is uh, on the title published at Jerusalem, that, but that is a publisher in Berlin. Haude and Spiner is uh, the publisher. And this um, book um, uh, from Köppen makes now a link between this uh, uh, French um, manuscripts and uh, Berlin, so it's uh, still not known how this link is, but we have to look a little bit more detailed in this person, Fred Frederick Köppen. Um, he was uh, a Freemason. He started with a new founded lodge, de Amitié, in Berlin. Um, then he went to this uh, Three Globes lodge after half a year. And when this uh, lodge was controlled by the strict observance, that was a, a special system which was introduced in Germany and became very, very popular, which dealt with the Templar story very strongly. Um, then Köppen um, went out of this lodge and created an own system, the African architects. In German, it's Afrikanische Bauherren. It's difficult to translate. Um, uh, and uh, this new system was run by Köppen and he claimed that uh, the pre-running uh, um, system from this African architects um, ba was based on a, a German radical enlightenment philosopher called um, Christian Wolf. So that is uh, um, the Köppen um, link to masonry, his um, own grand lodge, this African architects, um, was designed as a scientific and enlightened grand lodge. Um, the temple was a large library as it was written in the documents. He was um, doing uh, Scottish rite rituals in the first phase and um, then he also invented um, this Prussian knight Mythos. Um, this myth um, uh, was appearing there first time, and um, uh, the idea is that he invented this in opposite to the Templar um, stories from the um, uh, competing system of this um, strict observance. 
and he had the idea that uh, the Teutonic order, which has a, a link to the uh, ancestors of Frederick, would be a better story than, um, than the Templar. And uh, therefore, he invented um, this story of the Prussian Knights and added this um, to this Noachit um, uh, ritual. And um, the second period of these African architects then uh, uh, happened around about uh, 1770 because this um, um, story was not really successful in Berlin. Um, his African architects were, were not attractive to the brethren. And uh, so Köppen turned his system to an Egyptian ride in a way. Uh, he invented new things and moved away from scientific approach more to a ther theatralic approach. And, um, um, but also there he was not really successful. Uh, eight lodges are known from this system. And uh, later he got uh, uh, involved in a so-called Berlin Lodge war where the, uh, there was a lot of trouble between the Freemasons and the different Grand Lodges and later he was um, depressed, burned his archive and um, uh, the, this order collapsed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so it's um, the story of uh, this um, African architect or the first part of the story and it's a thin thread to Bordeaux because there is this book with this Prussian um, uh, ritual and this link. So, but there is an interesting fact that um, this African architects only eight lodges, but one was in Bordeaux. Um, this was uh, the uh, blazing star um, of the three lilies, um, <coughs> which um, uh, is uh, described in some books and publications um, from uh, your Cultura. Um, unfortunately, these uh, uh, documents he, he found were only on the, of the end of the last part of the, uh, this Lodge Le Etoy uh, Flamboyant. Um, um, and he uh, said that 1773, this Lodge received a patent from the African architects, uh, which also were called the Order the Royal Order of Silence in Berlin, and there was a, a provincial grandmaster, uh, Jean Frederick um, Kuhn, or jo Johann Friedrich Kuhn from Strasbourg, who, who was organizing this at that late time. Unfortunately, it's not known what happened before um, with, uh, with this um, uh, African architect's lodge in Bordeaux. In Bordeaux itself, <clears throat> there were uh, very early Freemasons, and interestingly, there was um, also a German-related lodge, La Amiette uh, Allemand, um, that were German merchants, which founded this lodge in uh, 1746. And um, when uh, this uh, founding took place, there was a a German person called Streckeisen, a Prussian consul later, who became citizen of Bordeaux. So it was um, really a, a close relationship. During the wartime, um, this lodge lost the uh, German attribute. It was then only La Amitié. Um, and after the uh, Slesian War was over, um, there was immediately a very close link to the um, opposite lodge in Berlin, Le Amitié in Berlin. So um, there are 17 Freemasons of Bordeaux which are known in this uh, lodge uh, in Berlin, which had, uh, uh, were accepted in this lodge. And so it seems that this lodge was initiated from um, the mer German merchants in Bordeaux. And so there was, <coughs> at the end, a strong link between Berlin and Bordeaux at that time. 
um, uh, after the seventh year also on the Masonic um, uh, level uh, with these two um, Amiti lodges and also by this African architect. And it might be interesting to, to investigate more details about this link and what, what uh, we could know about this. Um, so we, we could look a little bit closer to, to Köppen's background very fast. Um, what was it for a person? Um, there is a company, um, Split Gerber and Daum, and it was the largest uh, company in Prussia at that time. Uh, the founder was this uh, Gottfried Daum. He was the richest person in Prussia. And his partner, Splitgerber, um, <coughs> was uh, um, then uh, uh, paying off the Daum family and his uh, uh, relatives and continued uh, the company. Uh, it's known that uh, one of his grandson was uh, in, in Bordeaux and run the business from Bordeaux. And his, he was uh, married with the daughter of this um, Consul Streckeisen, and the other grandson was a Freemason at the Le Marti in, in Berlin and ran the business um, in Berlin. So there was still a close link over all the time. Um, uh, Daum um, um, and his family were out of this business. <coughs> um, Köppen was a grandson of this uh, founder. Um, he lived with his mother and his family in the Palais Splitgerber at the Paris, Pariser Platz in Berlin, close to the Brandenburg Gate. Today is it's, uh, the best place in, in Berlin. Um, and this uh, Palais later um, was bought by the French government and was a French embassy. Today, there is, uh, after the Second World War, the building was destroyed and the French embassy uh, is in a modern building, still on this place of Köppen, where he lived. And um, uh, he was, uh, during the wartime, very close to, um, to Frederick as a war paymaster, and uh, later he was a philanthropist and uh, was more or less a, a professional Freemason. He was only doing Freemasonry and uh, uh, running a library. His uncle, um, was um, the same philanthropist, and they both uh, founded this African architect. The uncle was the first grandmaster, later Köppen the grandmaster. And another interesting detail, um, the aunt of Köppen had uh, a lot of uh, uh, husbands. All of them, each after another, were privy chamberlain at the king, and also the daughter of this aunt, um, uh, was married with a privy chamberlain of the king. So um, finally, we could notice that there is a, a very close link of Köppen to Frederick the Great. On the one hand, by this um, business, because the king uh, um, did a lot of business with this company. And uh, on the other hand, by the direct um, uh, links um, uh, of the relatives uh, to the closest circle of the chamberlains of, of Frederick. So uh, the, it's clear that Köppen has access to the king and was uh, interacting with king. Um, open is really the king was um, um, interested in this idea of the African architects um, there are no documents which prove this. Um, the documents and books from the African architects which were published, they always claim that that is a royal order and legitimized by Frederick II, but it's not proved. If we uh, try to understand the mindset of Frederick as a philosopher king, that we, then we could say from his perspective um, the existing lodges in Berlin were not really attractive, that were merchants, ordinary citizens and officials, but um, uh, not uh, philosophers and scientists, which were members there. And uh, so it seems 
possible that there was a goal to create a scientific lodge after the uh, Third Slesian War. That was then the period when the king tried to renew his country, uh, build it up, and um, uh, uh, improve the performance of his society in a way. And so um, his first lodge, uh, the lodge premier, was a uh, I call it Newtonian Lodge. He did a lot of scientific work. He was reading uh, Newton's uh, um, uh, trans, uh, the translation of Voltaire of the Newton's uh, new uh, findings. So he was very inter interested in these things. Um, there was the claiming of this society of um, the truth. And uh, there was a comparison itself from these African architects in the documents with the Prussian Academy of Science, with the Academy of Science in Paris. They tried to be uh, something philosophical, but they failed finally, yes. But it might be um, that uh, um, um, Köppen founded this system, invented um, this Prussian knight got the royal um, proof for his activities um, and transferred it in a way to Bordeaux. Um, um, but he self failed in Berlin, so nobody was interested in this concept. It was not uh, intelligent enough, I think, but Maureen, uh, um, he could make uh, use of this um, royal background and um, this uh, um, Prussian um, uh, knights. So uh, <clears throat> finally, um, this uh, African architects disappeared and um, um, the king was more interested in people like Voltaire and uh, others which were part of his round table at Sans Souci, where uh, a kind of, of uh, festive board uh, was working, and um, um, that was his philosophical level, and these uh, African architects were not required. So in the last um, uh, slides, I want to show you um, a link to the second constitution. And that is also related, in a way, to uh, the war, in this case, to the American War of Independence. Um, the General Washington is a key person there. And um, Frederick was supporting this, uh, this uh, independence war um, with, in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, there were weapons for the... One minute. There were weapons which were delivered to, uh, via, via Bordeaux to, to the American uh, uh, military. And um, <clears throat> there was um, also some direct link uh, between Frederick and Washington. So there is a sword which uh, is claimed that it was a gift from Frederick to Washington in the year uh, 1780. And most important, um, there was a treaty of amity and commerce between uh, the Prussian king and uh, the newly founded um, American states. Um, this was um, signed 1785, and um, it was enthusiastically commented in letters um, um, on the American side, so Adams um, wrote that it was a, a, a step for the mankind, a lesson for the mankind, and also Washington wrote in exchange with Lafayette about this um, contract, and uh, the reason was that there were some paragraphs dealing with um, human rights and freedom of religious things and so on. Um, and this treaty um, leads to, uh, to a visit of Lafayette, 1786, in spring, uh, in Potsdam. Um, the Wanning uh, king um, had several uh, conversations with Lafayette. And um, 
uh, after this, there were still some letters between Washington and Lafayette, which uh, discussed this visit of Lafayette in, in, in Potsdam. And uh, there was a discussion about democracy, about uh, um, um, the question, is the king um, necessary for a, a, a well done uh, um, state, that was a position of Frederick, and on the other hand, uh, Washington and Lafayette were promoting democracy and were um, in general very positive thinking about Frederick, but um, um, uh, meaning that the Prussian king was on the wrong, wrong way with his, um, his, uh, um, his political opinion. And that means if we come back to the second grand uh, constitution at the same time when Lafayette was in Berlin um, discussing these um, political issues, there was uh, the, uh, the claim that the constitution was created in Berlin, signed by, by Frederick, and if you uh, look into this constitution, it's more or less uh, a document which describes a universal Masonic society or body with a sovereign grand commander. It's like a philosopher king in the sense of Frederick, and on the other hand, a democratic body. So it it's looks uh, in the content a little bit similar to these discussions. And so in the conclusion, um, uh, I would say um, there was um, a first attempt with this archi uh, African architects um, which failed in Berlin, but which was successful in Bordeaux and then later transferred to the Americas, what we have heard in detail today. And there was another discussion um, between uh, the American Freemasons, which were um, around uh, Washington and this uh, independence war and this movement uh, with Frederick. And there was this uh, point, uh, 1786 in Berlin, where uh, these two things um, may came together. And um, later, um, the death of Frederick some months later, the French Revolution, the subsequent wars um, uh, changed the political situations and so all these ideas of this um, uh, society design or the new society were um, not so important and maybe these um, pieces of these discussions were taken to, to uh, Built the final um, uh, Scottish Rite. Um, uh, the sovereign grand inspector John Mitchell was um, familiar with, with Washington itself, so they visited each other, so there might be information transferred to him. And finally, um, Lafayette is one signature, uh, 1834, under the um, Latin version of the constitutions. Uh, Lafayette also died a few months after this um, signature. And so um, there is no proof, but there are some um, interesting points which could be um, uh, researched more in, more in detail. Thank you for your uh, patience. Thank you very much, Arved. It is uh, 6.04, and so it's, uh, it's about time we conclude uh, on the Scottish Rite. Now, this last presentation, in my opinion, is a brilliant example of an issue we know very well in Masonic history. Uh, it is, uh, is it uh, a myth, or is it true? And that's something thing that we repeatedly face and what's important actually is uh, to think about the history of uh, that myth and that is how we move forward so now we know uh, very much about the Scottish right but uh, the other participants are already on the seventh floor and so I was told that if we want a drink too well we had better 
rush. Now, of course, the museum is still open for those of you who, who wish uh, to see the exhibition. Uh, but if not, please do join us on the seventh floor where you can have a chat with the speakers uh, and engage in various uh, types of uh, debate. Uh, thank you very much and see you on the seventh floor.